so your intestine secretes a bunch of stuff and that's basically to add water and buffer the chyme coming in from the summit because it's very acidic as well as just provide enough aqueous solution for churning and for dissolving of things and uh, space for enzymes to act. So enzymes do no good when they're dry, they're only effective when they're wet. So intestinal juice, which sounds gross, but it's important. Uh, it's secreted in the amount of about 1.8 liters or so per day. That's a lot. So think of a two liter bottle of soda, just a little bit less than that. So intestinal juice is secreted from the mucosa and it comes out of the blood. So it's a blood filtrate. And it's secreted by glands, which are stimulated both by touch receptors and stretch. So the physical contact of food with the walls of your intestine causes the secretion of the juice, which means that when your intestines are not full, no juice is secreted. So intestinal peristalsis, remember peristalsis is that squeezing of food down a tube. So you have two kinds, weak or strong. The weak peristalsis is centered around the pace setter cells. So these are the cells that are operating independently and that they spontaneously depolarize because their membranes are leaky. So those are those ones that are similar to the conduction system of the heart. So these produce relatively weak peristalsis towards the jejunum all the time. So this is primarily in the duodenum. And interestingly, this is a place where you also find gap junctions. So the gap junctions only require that one or two or very few cells be excited and that's enough to propagate the signal away from the site where it originated because, of course, cells are sharing uh, cytoplasm and therefore sharing ion depolarization. And that allows the spread of the signal anal word, which is apparently a word. Um, we call this the law of the gut. The law of the gut is really just that all movements are directed toward the anus for obvious reasons, right? That's where things come out. Strong peristalsis is unsurprisingly regulated by the parasympathetic nervous system. So remember from chapter 16, we said parasympathetic is rest and digest, emphasis here on digest, and sympathetic is fight or flight. So you would expect to see strong peristalsis in response to parasympathetic regulatory stimulation, and you would expect to see suppression of that stimulation via sympathetic innervation. So one of the first ones of these is reflexes stimulated by gastric stretch. So for example, I can think of two examples that are relatable for this. Um, there's, also, there's a gastrocolic reflex as well. So gastroenteric reflex stimulates motility along the small intestine. Um, gastroileal reflex opens the ileocecal valve so that things can move from the ileum into the colon. Not listed here, but also existing is the gastrocolic reflex, where uh, filling of the stomach triggers mass movements in the colon, uh, creating the urge to defecate. So um, this is why, for example, I have to take my dogs out to go to the bathroom like right after I feed them, uh, because otherwise they'll poop in the house. Turns out that's not a behavior problem, it's a physiological problem. Um, so when my doggy stomachs fill with food, there's a trigger that causes mass movements, and that's why they have to go to the bathroom after they eat. So uh, turns out humans have the same thing. So basically the idea is if there's new nutrition coming in, you have to make room for it, so you have to get older nutrition out of the way. And then for humans, if you, like, for example, eat breakfast and then consume a nervous system stimulant like coffee that urge is magnified. So we're returning to the pancreas, which we've seen before, because of course, I'm sure you all remember the pancreatic islets very fondly. So we're focusing less on the islets now because of course our time with the uh, 
endocrine system is over for now. Come back in the final little bit, but this time we're going to focus on the exocrine acini. So singular is acinus, plural is acini. Um, quick programming note, again, in the interest of everybody's success on the lab practical. One issue that I noticed um, that I want to warn you about is uh, plural versus singular. So if I have more than one thing highlighted or if the, the question says identify the structures with an S, that is your cue that your answer should be plural. On the contrary side of that, um, I saw a lot of people answering in the plural when only one thing was being indicated. So it is important to keep on top of plural and singular forms of things. So if I'm like pointing at one of these, like I circle clearly one clump of cells and not others, make sure that you're using the singular form, not the plural. So the acenar cells secrete enzymes, um, and there are lots and lots of pancreatic enzymes. So trypsin, chymotrypsin, trypsinogen, on and on and on and on and on. There are so, so many of them. And then interestingly, the ducts actually secrete stuff as well. So in most exocrine glands, the ducts are just kind of conveying whatever the gland secretes. They don't contribute anything themselves. That's not true for the pancreas. So for the pancreas, they both convey pancreas juice and also they add water and bicarbonate as well. So pancreatic ductal cells are important uh, for a buffering component. So the result is that the pancreas secretes this alkaline fluid into the duodenum. And that's important because the chyme coming in from the stomach is really acidic. But pancreatic enzymes, they only work in a basic environment. So the pH change is crucial for successful digestion. So here's the pancreas, and here you can see a little bit more of how it's sort of plugged into the duodenum. So its activity is controlled by hormones that come from the duodenum. So these are secretin. Guess what that does? Causes secretions. This one's nice because its name tells you what it's doing. And CCK. Um, and I meant to change this such that CCK was written out at least one place. Um, Mark loves to abbreviate without uh, elucidating sometimes. This stands for this word, which is cholecystokinin. The reason I wanted to spell that out for you is because um, the choles part refers to cholesterol, and cystic refers to the biliary tract specifically. Um, so basically, CCK is involved with um, secretion of both pancreatic enzymes that deal with proteins, but also regulating uh, fat digestion via pancreatic lipases, and also via bile. So that there's a, a clue about the action of this uh, hormone that's hidden in the word, which is why I wanted to write it out for you. So secretin is secreted as the chyme enters the duodenum. So there's pH and stretch sensors in the duodenum um, that detect the entrance of new material from the stomach. And then secretin is released in response to that. And this specifically targets the duct cells because the duct cells secrete water and bicarbonate, as well as phosphate. So these are both bases. And that's just gonna help to neutralize the acidic chyme coming in from the stomach. Now, it's not the only contribution that's alkaline. So the duodenum itself has those Brunner's glands that produce alkaline mucus. Um, but really, it's those two things together, the alkaline mucus and the alkaline secretions from the pancreas, 
that allow the duodenum to successfully neutralize the chyme. CCK is also important, but for a different reason, and that's because it's targeting the pancreatic acini, which is stimulating the secretion of the enzymes that are going to actually do the digesting. So speaking of the enzymes, pancreatic enzymes are many, as you can clearly see here. So salivary amylase was the amylase that is from your spit. We also have alpha amylase, which comes from the pancreas. So another enzyme to digest starch. We also have pancreatic lipase. So lipases digest fats. And we're about to start talking about the liver, so I'll talk more about fat digestion when I get to that. Additionally, we have nuclease. So we don't traditionally think of nucleic acids as being nutrients, but if you're eating living things, you're also eating DNA and RNA. So those have amino or th those have uh, covalent bonds as well, which have energy in them. So why not use them, right? The biggest class of enzymes, though, from the pancreas are ones that digest protein. So all of these subheadings here are all about breaking down proteins and subunits of proteins, which, if you look at the sheer number of them, is kind of shocking. So proteases and peptidases, what's the difference? Proteases target long, large proteins. Peptidases take the smaller chunks that the proteases leave behind and they chop those up into uh, amino acids and dipeptides. Notice a lot of these have OGEN at the end of them, meaning that they have to be activated before they're active. So trypsinogen turns into trypsin, chymotrypsinogen turns into chymotrypsin, Procarboxypeptidase turns into carboxypeptidase, and proelastase turns into elastase. Uh, quick question. Which connective tissue fiber do you think proelastase is targeted at? Bingo, very good, elastic fibers, yeah. Isn't that interesting? You have, a, you have an enzyme that comes from your pancreas that's specifically targeting elastic fibers. So trypsinogen is converted to trypsin by enteropeptidase. And trypsin does two things. Trypsin has its own catalytic activity, but it also converts the rest of these into their final form. So trypsin converts chymotrypsinogen into chymotrypsin and proelastase into elastase, et cetera, so forth. So that's pretty unusual um, from a metabolic pathway standpoint, uh, and it's remarkable for that reason. Oh, now I can use my arrow keys? Cool, thanks, computer. So the liver. It's this big triangular guy. And uh, this is a dad joke, so pardon me, but they call it your liver because you need it to live. Um, it does a ton of stuff and a lot of really important things. So it's really, really critical for survival because it's a real, it's a real workhorse of an organ. It does a lot for your body. So I'm not going to list all of the 200 or so functions it has because that's more than we have time for in this class, obviously, but you can sort of divide its many, many functions into categories. So that's what I'm doing here. So categorically, um, the metabolism side of things is it contributes to macromolecule metabolism, perhaps most significantly to lipid metabolism. Waste removal. So remember the hepatic portal vein drains into the liver and that cleans your blood before it goes back up to your heart and lungs. Vitamin storage and mineral storage. Um, so for example, iron is stored um, and other mineral ions are stored in the liver. 
as well as drug inactivation, or sometimes activation as well. So before I move on, um, I want to give you an applied science example of this because it's fascinating from a clinical perspective. So earlier, I mentioned uh, nervous system stimulants that are prescribed by doctors to treat uh, disorders like narcolepsy or ADHD, et cetera. So for drugs that tend to have a risk of dependency, like uh, Adderall, for example, and other stimulants, um, it is a goal of pharmacologists to create time release forms of those drugs. Because if you change the drug such that it does not deliver the instant gratification that people become addicted to, um, you can still treat the malady without having this other side of the coin in the form of addiction. So a lot of um, time release medications are time release because they're like coated with something. So they have like a, a slow release due to the gradual degradation of some blocker material. But there are some drugs that employ clever biochemistry. So this is where the big bucks are if you're becoming a biochemist who's going to develop pharmaceuticals. So if you are pretty familiar with the chemistry that happens in the liver and you're working for a pharmaceutical company, um, you can, for example, design drugs that are not active in the system until the liver and chemistry in the liver change them into an active form. And the liver has its own rate of doing these things. So what that means is you're going to be releasing the active form of the drug only as fast as the liver is changing it into the active form. So there are some drugs that work like that. All right. Hematological regulation. So with regard to this, um, if you haven't done case study three yet, this is going to start to get at some of that. So one important function of the liver is the production of plasma proteins. So most of the proteins in your blood plasma are created by the liver. Who can tell me which plasma protein contributes the most to blood colloid osmotic pressure? Does anyone remember? The answer is albumins. So albumins are a group of proteins that do a lot of stuff, um, but they have the biggest impact on blood colloid osmotic pressure, which is, remember, the pressure that allows blood to draw water back at the capillary bed. So if you have someone in liver failure and you take their blood, and if you look at it, you'll find that their albumins and plasma proteins are very low. And if we know that albumins are a primary driver of blood colloid osmotic pressure, having poor blood proteins means that you're not able to attract as much water back from your tissues, which results in a variety of pathologies. So think about that as you're completing case study three. It's a big old hint. Um, this is also a site of phagocytosis and antigen, antigen presentation. So are there, there are cells in the liver called Kupfer cells which are antigen presenting cells. Um, hormones that are not useful anymore and worn out red blood cells are disposed of here. One of the steps of vitamin D synthesis occurs in the liver. This is also where antibodies that are no longer needed go when they're no longer useful. So um, when the immune system is ramping down from a response, uh, primarily as the result of suppressor T cells, among others. Um, antibodies are directed to the liver. Removal and storage of toxins. So this is your built-in detox center. Uh, importantly, synthesis of bile. So this is where bile is made. And then the secretion of bile into the biliary tract uh, from the liver. 
So bile is important for emulsification of fats, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So biliary duct or biliary tract refers to the series of small tubes that convey bile. So your liver has a really big right lobe and a smaller left lobe. And the left hepatic duct and the right hepatic duct uh, collect bile from each of those lobes and they join to form the common hepatic duct. So left and right join to form common hepatic. The gallbladder does not make bile. It only stores it. And that's a really important distinction. This is why you can live without a gallbladder, but you can't live without a liver, one of the reasons. So the gallbladder is just for storing extra bile because of course we humans are designed, I'm using that in air quotes, uh, we've evolved to be omnivores. So we have a diet that varies according to a lot of things. Um, these days, mostly according to our preference, but in evolutionary history, according to things like food availability. So like, you know, for some of the year, this food is available and then that goes away and then another one is available. Um, so because of that, we have a lot of variation in the way our digestive system responds to food. And one of those is, let's say you sit down and you eat a really big fatty meal, like maybe you have steak and french fries or something. That requires a lot more fat emulsification than a meal like a salad. So you wanna have extra emergency just in case bile for that. So the gallbladder is attached to the common hepatic duct via the cystic duct. And after those two things join up, then we call it the common bile duct. And the common bile duct runs down through the pancreatic tissue and it joins up with the pancreatic duct. So here's where that is. And then you have a sphincter of smooth muscle that wraps around those two ducts so that both bile and pancreatic juice are released out of the same hole. And then bile is able to emulsify fats and facilitate fat digestion. So not only does the gallbladder store bile, it also modifies it. So it's, con it's capable of concentrating bile. So turning it into a less watery, more potent form. Cholecystokinin stimulates the ejection of bile. So I mentioned earlier that uh, I wanted to write out the entire word for cholecystokinin because it contains a hint about what it does. This is that hint. So bile, specifically bile salts and bile acids, are basically detergent molecules. So they do the same thing as dish soap, essentially. Um, they surround lipid particles and make them smaller, which I'll show you in the next slide. Uh, and those are also made out of cholesterol. So dietary cholesterol, a lot of it's converted into bile. So cholecystokinin stimulates contractions of the gallbladder and that causes bile to be ejected into the duct system. Um, it also relaxes the hepatopancreatic sphincter, which is the sphincter that regulates the passage of bile out. By the way, the gross anatomical structure here, where the two ducts release their fluids is called the major duodenal papilla. It's called the major one because there's a minor one, which is where the accessory pancreatic duct empties. Uh, the accessory pancreatic duct only delivers pancreatic juice. The major duodenal papilla is attached to both bile secretion and pancreatic juice. So bile is important. Here's why. Think about a time when you made some or, or ate some salad dressing that was a vinaigrette. So maybe you bought a bottle of it in the store and you probably noticed that oily layer on the top. If you were to just pour that bottle on your salad, you would get a bunch of oil and no vinegar, yuck. So what do you do to the bottle to make sure that your salad dressing tastes good? You shake it a bunch. 
So that's emulsifying the fat in the oil with the water in the vinegar mechanically, meaning, you know, by just agitating it. That's not a good strategy for fat digestion for us. Like imagine if every time you ate fat, you had to like jump up and down a lot <laughs> to digest it. That doesn't make much sense. So instead, we've got these amphipathic molecules. So there's a polar end, and there should be a minus sign on here because carboxyl groups are minus. Um, well, I'll just add it later. And then there's the hydrophobic end. So this is... I'm drawing with my mouse, so pardon my handwriting. This end is water friendly, and this end is water fearing. So the way this works is when you eat fat, the fat ends up being liquefied, and it forms these big, huge droplets in your stomach lumen and in your intestinal lumen, and that's because it's in a watery environment, so hydrophobic substances like fat are going to tend to coalesce into these big, huge puddles. Those have a lot of volume and not very much surface area. And that's a problem because enzymes need access to the surface area in order for them to digest. So the enzymes here are not able to do their work on a big, huge droplet of fat. Fortunately, bile acids are amphipathic, so their cholesterol end sticks to the fat and then their hydrophilic ends are not only miscible in the water, but they also attract to each other. And when they do that, they just pull little bits of fat off of the giant glob. So they basically are coming in and taking little tiny bites out of the big fat puddle until it's emulsified into small little orbs, basically. And this fat is considered to be emulsified. This is the right size of fat droplet for enzymes to begin accessing and, say, pulling fatty acids off. So you go from having triglycerides to having two fatty acids and a monoglyceride. Um, those are more useful to us dietarily, and the enzymes are able to do that to these smaller aggregations of fat. So before we move on to regulation of gastric activity, uh, another clinical relevance thing. Gallbladder removal surgery is pretty common. Um, and typically what happens with gallbladder removal surgery is uh, someone is going to, and actually I want to go back to the last slide for this. So here's how gallbladder surgery and the need for it manifests. Person has a meal, and about 25 to 45 minutes after the meal, they have very intense spasmodic right upper quadrant pain. So right upper quadrant, and remember that's from, from our body directional terms from 241. Um, that's just if you divide your abdomen into to nine squares, the right upper one is that quadrant. So right upper quadrant pain can mean a bunch of things, but if it follows a meal in that time pattern, what's happening is that that's enough time for the stomach to have begun emptying and cholecystokinin is released in response to the duodenum receiving chyme. And cholecystokinin is then gonna act on the gallbladder to cause it to contract because the wall of the gallbladder is made of smooth muscle. If that person has a gallstone that's blocking their biliary tract, the contraction of the gallbladder is basically pushing that stone into the wall of the cystic duct and that causes really bad pain. And because cholecystokinin is released in kind of a pulsatile fashion, so every time the stomach receives a, a allotment of chyme, more cholecystokinin is released, you get these waves of gallbladder pain. So that's called a gallbladder attack. So if you have enough of those, then you go in to see a gastroenterologist and they give you an ultrasound and discover that your gallbladder is full of stones, they'll just go ahead and remove it. Here's the deal though. Once you've had your gallbladder removed, 
You can still make bile because that stuff comes from the liver, but you can't store it anymore. So after your gallbladder removal surgery, your surgeon will sit down with you and say, okay, so you can still eat fat, but if you eat too much fat in one sitting, you're going to get a nasty consequence called steatorrhea, which means oily diarrhea. <laughs> Gross. Um, and that's because without the gallbladder to store concentrated bile, there's a limit to how much fat emulsification that you can do in one sitting. So you can't outrun the trickle of bile coming in from your liver. Uh, there's a question in the chat, and that's what are the stones made of? Um, basically, super saturated bile acids tend to form crystals, and they turn into little, little rocks. So they're made out of cholesterol, basically. I bet you didn't know cholesterol could form a crystal, but now you do. They're actually quite pretty. They tend to be black on the edges and have like a yellow center um, if they're dried out, but they're insidious because they cause you a bunch of pain. Okay, so let's talk about stomach emptying since I just mentioned it. You wanna allow your food to sit in your stomach for long enough to get it nice and liquidy and allow for pepsin to have time to work, but you don't want food to sit in there for too long. So regulation of gastric activity is complicated because it's elaborate dance between the stomach and the duodenum. So stomach emptying needs to be slow enough for the duodenum to have time to deal with what it receives, but different meal types require different approaches, right? So if I eat a really fatty meal, I'm going to need more time to emulsify that fat, which means my stomach can't empty as fast, versus if I eat a really watery meal, my stomach's going to empty more quickly. So there's lots of feedback loops regulating gastric activity according to, in part, what it is exactly that you ate. So there are short reflexes of the enteric nervous system. That's what ENS stands for. And I'll show you uh, some visual slides of this because I know it's hard to imagine if you're not looking at it. But also GI tract hormones, so things like secretin, gastrin, etc. And there are three phases of gastric activity uh, one of them is before you even eat food. So cephalic is that one. You have gastric, which is when food is in your stomach, and then you have the intestinal phase, which is during the time when your stomach is emptying and your duodenum is receiving chyme. So this figure is an overview of the phases in order, and we're going to examine them in order. So I know that they're really small here. The next couple of slides zoom in on them, so don't panic about not being able to read the words. But I do want to pause here and say, um, as far as where to direct your attention in this chapter, uh, this is a really good figure to be very familiar with because it really summarizes gastric regulation uh, as succinctly as possible, but also with a lot of information. So let's start with the cephalic phase. Um, as I mentioned, this is before you even eat food. So for example, um, downstairs, dinner is being cooked right now and I am hungry. So I'm probably in the cephalic phase currently. So this is initiated by not food itself, but the sight, smell, sometimes the taste or the thought of food. So if you're really hungry and you're like, hmm, hamburgers, you're in the cephalic phase. So there's a link between thinking about food or smelling it and parasympathetic stimulation of the stomach via our friend, the vagus nerve. Remember that cranial nerve? It does everything. It in innervates all of your abdominal viscera. Here it is again. So vagal efferent impulses stimulate the stomach. And the whole goal here is that if you're in the cephalic phase, that means food is anticipated. So you got to prepare the stomach. You don't want food to be plopping down into a dry stomach with no juice in it. That wouldn't make sense. So this is going to prepare the stomach for food. So gastric juice is secreted. 
And that, of course, includes watery secretions containing pepsinogen and hydrochloric acid, but also mucus, because you want to protect your stomach lining from the acid. So emotions can exacerbate or inhibit the cephalic phase. So for example, um, anxiety, which is an emotion, is also linked to sympathetic nervous system stimulation. So even if you need to eat physiologically, if you are very upset, you may be unable to do so because uh, your cephalic phase is being interrupted by uh, your nervous system and your emotions. So obviously when you get into emotions and eating behavior, things get pretty complicated because, you know, humans eat for so many reasons other than being hungry. Like, you know, I'm bored, I'm going to eat, or I'm sad, I'm going to eat my feelings, or I'm sad, I'm not going to eat. So that stuff really depends on your emotional state and history and behavior and all that. So the gastric phase lasts for quite a bit longer, and this has a range as well. So this is between three and four hours. Um, it's initiated by food coming in, because food arriving in your stomach stretches the walls, and there are stretch receptors in your stomach which respond to food. So distension is one, so that's the stretch receptors. Also an increase in pH. So if your stomach has been filling with acidy water and then you eat food, odds are the food is not as acidic as the water. And so you're gonna see an increase in pH as stomach uh, fills up. Protein and peptides as well. Caffeine and low levels of alcohol. So this is why bars a lot of times serve food because people that are imbibing will often want to eat. So stretch causes histamine release. And histamine is going to do two things. One, stimulate parietal cells. The other is stimulate secretion of water from the mucosa into the gastric lumen. So you get this watery mixture of acid entering the stomach. Stretch and the increase in pH, which is detected by pH sensors, chemoreceptors, activates the myenteric and submucosal plexus. So the submucosal plexus is, as it sounds like, a nerve plexus in the submucosa. And the myenteric plexus is a nerve network in the muscle. And these are two nervous system structures, but they have different functions which we'll go over in the next slide. There's also hormonal responses. So neural impulses and the presence of peptides stimulate gastrin secretion. So we talked about gastrin, um, that's secreted by those G cells, and that's going to kick off the process of digestion by activating chief cells and parietal cells. So I mentioned the two different plexuses. Um, they're different in location, so submucosa versus muscularis externa, and they're also different in their function. So the submucosa is close to the mucosa and therefore close to the gastric glands. So it's gonna act on the mucosa to cause the secretion of gastric juice. The myenteric plexus is responsible for movement of the stomach. So this plexus is gonna begin the process of churning the food and exposing a lot of its surface area to acid and to enzymes. So the result is you homogenize your food and you also acidify the chyme by tumbling it around in a basically a vat of acid. So this helps to initiate protein digestion. Um, and one of the key pieces of info here for protein digestion is uh, the thing that turns pepsinogen into pepsin is exposure to hydrochloric acid. So you need both. Now, as pH drops, the concentration of protein drops because protein is being chopped up by pepsin into smaller chunks. And so the decline in the amount of protein provides 
less stimulus for gastrin release, you also get a, dec a decline in gastrin. So this is a little bit of an automatic negative feedback loop uh, that just happens automatically as protein changes into smaller peptides. All right, the intestinal phase. So this is where we have a lot of communication between the duodenum and the stomach. So the duodenum is basically in charge of telling the stomach what it can handle. So whether it's going too fast or too slow and how much time it needs between expulsions of chyme into the duodenum. So to give you some sort of uh, context for this, I mentioned that this is going to depend on what you ate. So meals that are high in fat or high in dietary fiber, which is more difficult to digest, uh, stomach emptying takes longer in those cases because the duodenum needs more time to deal with what it's receiving before it passes that material on to the jejunum. So this is why certain meals will have you feeling full for much longer than others. So if I like, so last night, for example, I ate um, a bunch of roasted vegetables on top of a bed of kale with some tofu. So like really, really, really fibery meal. And I was full for hours. The same cannot be said of very watery foods. So have you ever had the experience where you go eat like some Vietnamese pho and you're really, really full after you eat, but then like 45 minutes later, you're like, dang, I'm hungry again. How did that happen? Um, when you eat watery meals, your stomach tends to empty really fast. So that's the, the reason why you have these different experiences with different kinds of foods. All right, so response to stimuli. One thing that happens is mucus production from Brunner's glands. So those are the glands in the submucosa of the duodenum. And they're going to basically help along with the secretion of uh, pancreatic juices to neutralize the chyme coming in. There's also the enterogastric reflex. So enteric, uh, use this cue to think about the intestine, specifically the small one. And gastric means stomach. So this is communication and a reflex arc between the duodenum and the stomach. So basically, gastrin is inhibited, as well as peristalsis is inhibited um, by the enterogastric reflex. So the release of gastric inhibiting peptide, that's what GIP stands for, um, as well as secretin and cholecystokinin, these all feed back negatively onto the stomach and the enterogastric reflex um, is also participating. So we got this effect on the myenteric plexus as well. And the pyloric sphincter gets smooshed shut. So that's the duodenum saying, hey, pause for a second. I need a minute to deal with what I've just received. So cholecystokinin and gastric inhibiting peptide are stimulated by the presence of lipid and carbohydrates. So this is the link between the full spelling of this word. Um, cholecystokinin is secreting or triggering the secretion of pancreatic enzymes, but it's, it's really specific to fat. Secretin secretion, which sounds redundant, but it's not. Secretin is secreted by the duodenum. And it's pH specific. So if the pH is less than about four and a half, it's gonna inhibit the parietal and the chief cells. In addition to that, it triggers the secretion of the ductal cell buffer juices from the pancreas. So remember that the ducts are the ones that secrete bicarbonate and phosphate. And this is also going to stimulate bile secretion. If proteins are present in the chyme, so again, the rate of emptying and this feedback loop is partially determined by what the contents of the meal were. If proteins are present, then intestinal gastrin is secreted. 
All right, so I think I'm going to actually stop here because this is the launching point for the large intestine, and I think that that probably is a good stopping place video-wise. Um, so that's where we'll pick up on Friday. And I'm going to stop recording now.